Well, welcome to North Village Church. So good to see you here this morning. We, there are some who are recording the World Cup, and so no, no spoilers, right, for those who are following along uh, on your phone. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Uh, you can go to page 76 in your devotional. Hopefully you have that, that with you. That's our gift to you if you're new here this morning. Take that home with you and, and uh, use that uh, this morning. And, and, and we have tablets. We pass to the to the aisle, that's our way to stay connected as a church family, right? We're rallying around build and belong, closer relationships with one another, and the tablets help us move in that direction. This last week, uh, last Sunday after worship, uh, everybody was exiting uh, the, the space, and, and I was turning off the lights and headed out the door, and then as I'm walking out the door, I hear somebody in the back of our church, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's still here, and so I set my backpack down by the door, and I, I walked to the back to find out, like, hey, we're leaving, and, and uh, they ended up exiting out uh, the back door, and then as I make it around uh, to the front, I, I realize uh, in that short span of time, somebody has stolen my backpack, right, lickety split, out the door, made a run for it, but never the fear, because I go into inspector gadget mode, and I think to myself, if I stole something, what would I do? Check trash cans. So I immediately start patrolling the area, looking in trash cans, looking in dumpsters, and I notice there's a fence over here behind Shipley's that is ajar of the gate. And so I go back there, and I have this moment of, like, if you've seen the movie I Am Legend, like, fear, like, I don't want to walk in there. But I got to go find my backpack, and so I do. And as I turn the corner, I look, and there it is. There's my backpack, my beloved backpack, and my binder, and my favorite pen, and my Bible. And I'm so excited to uh, keep looking, and my MacBook is not there, and uh, it's gone. And so I'm excited, but I, I got to find my MacBook. And so if you don't have Apple devices, they have a Find My Device in Apple. And so sure enough, I pull out my phone, and I can see my MacBook pinging around the city, like, oh, there it is, oh, there it is, there it is, and so I jump in my car, and I go, and I find the people who uh, have taken my MacBook, and, you know, at this point, I'm debating, do you tackle uh, somebody to get the MacBook back, and so you have your opinions, I chose not to, we had conversations, and maybe this is naive on my part, but they said, we don't have it right now, but we will return it to you. Uh, it's uh, it hasn't come back yet, and <laughs> I'm still still hoping. Our elders have told me to let it go. It's not coming uh, back. The the pinging service, you know, of that find my uh, phone and and devices that's no longer working. The battery is dead, uh, and so it's gone. Uh, but um, there's still a part of me, you know, a small sliver that one day my beloved. Uh, MacBook will, will return. You might be wondering, how does that fit into our, our message this morning? Well, in the same way that I'm missing my MacBook and kind of looking, you know, for that MacBook to, to return uh, to home, I think in some ways, as, as a whole, that there's a, there's a spiritual layer in us that feels like maybe something's missing in, in our lives. And maybe 100%, or maybe it's just like there's a sliver where it just seems like our relationship with God Right, hearing his voice, kind of that pinging service, like our soul pinging out into the universe. Right, I feel like in some ways, uh, you know, there's a part of us that feels like we're not getting a strong signal uh, in in return, and we're we're struggling to kind of navigate and follow the Lord, and we're wondering where is the Lord at work in the life of of his people. Maybe we're wondering that at the at the national level, the global level, maybe in our church, maybe even just personally. Like right? we're we're struggling to kind of like, where are you? You, Lord. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look in Luke chapter 2, the birth announcement of God in the flesh, the baby in a manger. And, and it's in that context that we're going to see the God of Scripture is at work in the most unlikely of places, in the most unlikely of ways. So that we're going to see three subpoints this morning. We're going to see what would you expect, why would you not expect, and where should we look? So let's look at this first one. What would you expect, right? We're going to, your devotional, man, I, I encourage you to write things down in your devotional. Right? You're not writing down what I say like it's so smart. Like the reason we're here this morning is to hear from God, for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And so even if there's fragments of thoughts, things that he's stirring in you this morning, write that down in that devotional. Record it somewhere so the Spirit can continue to, to work on that. So use your devotional uh, for those types of things. In your devotional, there's just page 14. We're going to look at verses 1 to 7 to see the context of verse 
14. It starts off this way. It says, Now, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. I highlighted some words throughout that, that passage just to help us kind of see that like right from the beginning that, that the, there is unexpectedness to this passage. Then it starts with the geographical locations and the historical events. Like if you scan through verses 1 to 7 on your own, like you just see these references uh, to, to Caesar in verse 1, a census in verse 2, uh, Syria, Nazareth, Galilee, Bethlehem. Right? These are all detailed, detailed notes, right? detailed locations, detailed events, because when we look at Luke chapter 1, we find that Luke is the original Inspector Gadget. Well, Luke is the original Dora the Explorer going to go find her backpack, right? Luke is, a, is, a, is an investigative reporter, and Luke is investigating the claims of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and return. And so this is layered with detailed events, historical locations. These are all real events, real locations you can go to today, right? And you think about our culture today, and we're... If you look online or maybe you talk to friends at, at work, uh, people today are wondering, what does Jesus think about sexual identity? Now, this is really kind of a buzzword. What does Jesus think about homosexuality? What does Jesus think about uh, uh, transgenderism? Right? And, and it's almost like they've forgotten there are much more fantastic claims than what Jesus thinks about sexual identity. Right? I mean, just right off the back, like this is what Luke is investigating, like that Jesus claimed to be born of a virgin. That's not normal. You don't just like, like you don't have anybody in your family who makes that claim. Like that's a radical claim to be born of a virgin. Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. Historically, anyone throughout history who claimed to be God has always been crazy. And Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. That's, that's, that's radical. Jesus claimed to be perfect. This is what Luke is investigating. Jesus didn't claim to be a good guy. Good guy, do some good things to help the people. He claimed to be perfect. Crazy people make those types of claims. He said he would die. He told people, I'm going to die, and in three days, I'm going to resurrect. Like that was normal. And then I'm going to go to 7-Eleven and get a Slurpee. Like that's crazy. Like, we're not even debating, can you resurrect? Just the fact that he claimed that he was going to conquer death in the resurrection was bonkers. It's bonkers. This is what Luke is investigating. And, and then he claimed, you know, just to top it all off, just in case that wasn't enough for you, Jesus said, oh, yeah, I'm going to return. I'm going to go away, and then after a period of time, I'm going to come back in glory. And that's crazy. Those are all radical claims like like if if you're here this morning like no matter where you are in your your spiritual journey like you can you can think about christmas the birth of jesus and uh, and following jesus and you have to either think that he's crazy or that you believe it wholeheartedly does that make sense like these claims are so radical so fantastic you either have to think like this is this is this is true and I'm going to give my whole life, my time, my money, my energy, my resource to this. Or you need to think it's bonkers. Like there's no in-between. Like that's how radical it is. Like when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, there's nothing casual about Christmas, about Christmas, about Jesus. Like you either need to think like, I believe this or it's crazy. That's why Luke gives us such detailed about geographical locations. 
These are all real places, historical events, because he knows it's bonkers. He knows these claims are radical, that they're fantastic. And so he's draping it in detailed events. Any other writing you read today, right, with with, with fantastic claims, it comes with fantastic locations, Hogwarts, right, Middle Earth. It comes with fantastic beings like dragons and fairies, but it's not It's not in the gospel of Luke. These are fantastic claims draped with historical events. And then as we zoom in on those historical events, you would think that they would zoom in on Rome. Rome is mentioned, Caesar Augustus or uh, or Athens. Athens is a real place. The wisdom of Athens would have been known at this time. Or Jerusalem. We just studied Nehemiah. Jerusalem's a big deal. But where, where does the, the fantastic claims of Jesus born of a virgin zoom in on? Bethlehem. It's like telling you Hutto's the most exciting place on earth. Like Hutto, Buda. Like Buda. God is going to do amazing. Nobody thinks God's going to do anything amazing out of Buda. And it's not even the town square of Bethlehem. right? It's not even like the, the mayor's office in Bethlehem. It's a manger, right? So I just need you to hear that, the unexpectedness of Bethlehem, especially today. Like if you were at all in that place of like your soul pinging out into the cosmos of wondering, Lord, where are you at work? How are you moving in my life? How are you moving in our day? Because I don't know if I'm naive. I don't know if I'm misremembering. But I just feel like it was easier to see where the Lord was working in the past. Like I... Like, you look at our politicians, like Republican, Democrat, like, I don't know, like today where I, I'm just like, where are you, Lord? What are you doing in, like, the politicians? Like, I know they weren't perfect before. I know, I know, they all got skeletons in the closet. But I just felt like it was easier to see, oh, I see where you might be moving there, Lord. Whereas today, I'm like, I don't know, Lord. Like, in our schools today, I love teachers. Teachers are amazing. Teachers are doing the hard work of nurturing kids in broken, neglected families. It's so hard. But I find myself wondering, Lord, where are you in these schools? Like before, I feel like I used to be like, I can see. I, I know. I know it's not perfect. I can see. But I'm, today, I'm like, I don't know, Lord, where are you? In our health care? Right? I used to, doctors and nurses are amazing, but I just, I have more. I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? Like these corporations, this mani- I don't trust any. I'm just apathetic. Like, what does it matter? What's, what's, do you feel any of that? Like even at the church as a whole. I mean, the church is in the news a lot these days. And I just find myself thinking more frequently, Lord, where are you? I mean, are you moving in ways that I don't know or I don't see? Like, I know you're real. I know you're alive. I know you're, I just, I'm struggling to see that. And so if you're in that place, a little bit or a lot, like if you're in the place of asking, Lord, where are you at work in the lives of your people today? It's in Luke 2, God's word, the announcement of God taking on flesh as an infant that we see the Lord is at work in the least likely of places, a manger in Bethlehem. The Lord passes over the power of Rome, the capital city of the empire. The wisdom of Athens, no thanks, not interested. The religion of Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem, obviously a big deal. He says, nah, I'm going to Bethlehem, the least unlikely of places. I'm going to show up in the least unlikely of ways. Listen to me. If any baby was born in a manger today, it'd be a tragedy. Any baby out in the woods in a horse trough, we would think, Somebody missed something, right? We would think somebody wasn't paying attention. We would ask the question, God, where are you? God, how could you have let this happen? God, don't you, don't you care? We would ask those questions, right? And yet it's in that context. Luke chapter 2, a manger in Bethlehem, that he's at work. He's at work in the lives of his people. That's our first question. Let's look at our, our second question. Why would you not expect a manger in Bethlehem, right? Right, we're asking that question. And in some ways, in many ways, the, the birth of Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem is a complete surprise. 
What are you doing, Lord? Yet for those, for those people who know God's word, who know the scriptures, then a manger in Bethlehem, it's a bit on the nose. It's a bit obvious. It's a bit obvious. Let's just read it again. Verses 1 to 7. It says, Now, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and he was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Again, I highlighted some words, all right, emphasis added, all right, to kind of bring attention, all right, that, that, that the God of Scripture, he's going to move through the line of David, the genealogy of David. And so there's, there's an emphasis. It's David and Bethlehem, the family, is over, over and over. Over And for, for, for those of us who aren't familiar with God's word, then we just read over those verses because we're like, so I was born of Tom and Janet, so what? <laughs> like, does it matter? <laughs> like, it doesn't resonate uh, with us. But if you know God's word, and the people at this time in Luke chapter 2, they would have known the Old Testament. They would have been draped in the Old Testament. So that Luke chapter 2 is like, Look over here, like strobe lights, like jump off the page that a manger in Bethlehem is the most likely of places, right? It's just because over and over throughout the Old Testament, there's promises of a Savior. There's, 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 there's details of when and where and how. And the, I'll just give you a few. You can read more on your own. This is Micah chapter 5. It says, but you, O Bethlehem. Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. So this is a promise that the baby's going to come out of, out of Bethlehem. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. This supernatural being somehow is going gonna, is gonna to enter, and Bethlehem is going to play a central role. Isaiah 11 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, that's David's dad, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And so they know, oh, from the line of David, oh, that's right, these promises have been repeated over and over. Jeremiah 23, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Like these are all promises. And there's over 300. They're just detail after detail. That when you look at the historical events and the geographical locations of Luke chapter 2. That it's like this is where it's going to happen. And it's not just the references to, to David. If you if you know the book of Exodus, the story of Moses, like it's almost like these stories are parallel. Like in the story of Moses, there's a, there's a pharaoh. And in the story of Jesus, there's a, a Roman ruler, right? In the story of Moses, there's, there's oppression of the people. They're enslaved, right? They're being hurt and in the same way in Luke chapter 2. They're, they're being oppressed. They're being forced to have to travel across the land with minimal means, right? There's, the, there's a story of a baby, right? The baby uh, in a basket floating down the river, the hope of a savior coming out of Egypt. In Luke chapter 2, there's a, a baby, right, placed in a manger, the, the hope of a, of a savior to, to rescue the people. It doesn't jump off the page to us if we're not familiar with the scriptures, but if you know the scriptures, you read Luke chapter 2, and you're just like, oh, it's kind of obvious, right? That, that if you were a person in this day, and you know the Savior is coming, 
a righteous branch is coming, a redeemer is coming, a Messiah is coming, well, then you would start walking around Bethlehem. And you would start looking for a woman, a woman, a woman, a woman, who's been oppressed, who's being oppressed by an imperial power, so much so that she has to give birth to a baby in, in a basket. I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious Right? So you see it's just, in some ways it's, a, it's unexpected, and in, and in some ways it's kind of obvious. And our faith is kind of like that. Like as a follower of Jesus today, if you believe in Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and promised return, well, then there's a part of our faith that's very mystical. It's very mysterious. It's, it's, it's unexplainable. It's, I don't know. It's, I just, I believe, right? There's, there's that part of it. And at the same time, it's kind of obvious. It's black and white. That's, that's, what it, that's what we see throughout the scripture, right? That, that the God of scripture creates humanity to be in relationship with him because of our sin. Like we fall away, right? We reject him. So that from Genesis 3 on, he is about the business, about the plan, about the purpose to redeem, to restore what rightfully belongs to him. So that in some ways, it's very mysterious, Creation, sin, how does that all that happen? But it's all obvious also because from that point on, there's promises of how he's going to do it, where he's going to do it, why he's going to do it, who he's going to do it. There's the foreshadowing. There's the temple. There's the sacrifices. There's the priests. There's the prophets. Do you see that? It's, a, it's, it's very mysterious. I don't know how it's going to happen, but then, oh, it's kind of obvious. It's, it's very black and white. You see how it's going to happen? So that he's born. He lives a perfect life. He does miracles. To, 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 to verify, well, this is what I said I was going to do, and then I did what I said I was going to do. So that it's mysterious, it's kind of obvious. And then he willingly lays his life down at the cross. It's very mysterious, but it's very obvious. He does it up on a hill so that everybody can see. And then he conquers death in the resurrection. It's very mysterious, but it's very obvious. He appears to over 500 people over a period of 40 days. Do you see that? So that our, our faith is... Our faith is one that's very mysterious and very obvious at the same time. So you this morning, as you, as you were following the Lord, that if you were asking that question, where are you at work in the lives of your people today? Where are you at work, Lord, in, in, in my life, in my marriage, in my children, in my church, in my city? If you're asking that question, what, what, what the manger in Bethlehem is teaching us is that it's, it's mysterious. And it's a bit obvious. So let's go to our third point to tell us where to look. See that it is mysterious and it is obvious. Where should we look? First one, mysterious and obvious, Jesus' life. Right, if you're wrestling, just heart sincerity of just like, man, I'm just struggling to see where the Lord is at work in the lives of his people. You start in the life of Jesus. You, you, you look at Jesus' life, how he lived his life, how he, how he approached people, how he talked to people the miracles he performed, who he rebuked, who he was gentle with. You, you look at his death. You look at why he died, the way he died, how he responded to the people as he was being led to his death. You dive in deep and you study his death. You absolutely, you examine the resurrection. You can't just be flippantly, oh, yeah, and then Jesus rose from the dead. Like, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, what? You, like as a follower of Jesus today, all the amount of time we could spend just thinking, reflecting, considering, reading, studying Jesus' claim of his resurrection. We would look at his promise of return, that we would look at the life of Jesus that he's going to, he said he was going to return. What does that even mean? What does that mean that he's going to return in glory? That we wouldn't be casual. Like sometimes I come on Sunday to North Village Church and I listen to this guy talk and I sing some songs and the people are great. That's casual. No, you, you own your faith. right? You dive deep into to the life of Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, listen to me, church family, now is not the time to put it on cruise control. Now is not the time. That if you are asking that question, like, Lord, where are you at work in the lives of your people? Now is not the time to be watching TV. He's not there. Like, that's not where you want to look for him. 
Like, nothing wrong with watching TV. I watch TV. I'm just saying that that's not where you're going to find him in, a, in, in, in the TV of our day. No, we can't just veg out. We can't just go from, like, from, from headline to headline to headline. Isn't it played out by now? Like, have you, don't you smell it, like, the next headline, fear, like, anxiety? We're all going to die. Like, I mean, it's just like, I, like, smell it coming. You're like, ah, God, I, let me guess. I can tell you what's going to happen next. Like, it's just played out. You can smell it. Let's not get hooked by that any longer. Let's not give our time to those types of things. Getting swept up in the drama of, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Ah. I don't either. Look at Jesus' life. Like, if you want to know where the Lord is at work in the lives of his people, it's not in those places. Let's look at the life of Jesus. But let's dive in. Second one, God's word. It's a bit obvious. It's a bit obvious, right? Here at North Village Church, what? <laughs> yeah, look at God's word. If you're struggling to see God's hand at work in the lives of his people, get into his word. Not just the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but look at the whole of Scripture. Look at Genesis. Look at, study the first 12 chapters of Genesis alone. You could spend a year just deep diving into the first 12 chapters of Genesis. It's, 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 it's repeated over and over throughout humanity. You should know the first 12 chapters of Genesis. Know, know the history of Israel. Study the history of Israel, the, the poetry of Israel. Get into the Proverbs and the Psalms. Look at the, the prophets the major prophets, the minor prophets. Just study God's word. Memorize God's word. Reflect on God's word. Talk with other people about God's word. Go into the New Testament. Look at the book of Acts. Study the, the, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, like where you know off the top of your head the locations that he went to and the churches that were started. And then go read those epistles, the letters that he wrote to those churches and where he was encouraged by what the Lord was doing and where he was rebuking the people. Read Revelation. Read Revelation. It's okay. It's okay. You can do it. Just read it. Just read it and just start like, okay. And just bathe in God's word. Like how much more time are we going to give to the, to the powers of Rome and what Elon is doing Ugh, with Twitter? And oh, Tesla and SpaceX, like what Kanye said. How much time are we going to give to what Kanye said? What Kim Kardashian is doing. The next headline in the news, the powers of Rome, the wisdom of Athens. How many more podcasts are we going to listen to Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson? Are they smart? Yeah. They say interesting things? Yeah. You're not going to see God's hand at work in the lives in those places. So that if you're faint-hearted, if you're discouraged, if you're wondering, Lord, where are you work? It's not in the wisdom of Athens. It's not in the religion of Jerusalem. It's not in the next self-help, eat this food, run this lap, do these things. It's all, I mean, there's YouTube influencers that are just making millions off of us because we're like, maybe the Lord is at work over here. He's not. He's not. Like, so why? There's nothing wrong with those things. But if you're wanting to see the Lord's hand at work in the life, go to God's word. Go to God's word. Become a student of God's word and just bathe in God's word. The next one, the church, his people. It's obvious. It's mysterious. All right, the apostle Paul uh, uh, writes in Romans chapter 1, he says, I long to see you. He's writing to the church in Rome. I long to see you so that I... I may be encouraged by you. The Apostle Paul. Dude's a beast. And yet he's thinking, I want to see God's hand at work in the lives of his people. I need to get to, the, I need to, get to God's people. He's out proclaiming the gospel, starting churches, and his heart's desire, I, gotta get to, I want to be encouraged. I want to encourage you. I want to be encouraged by you. So yes, the church, the church is in the news a lot today. And so when I say the church, like, yes, there's the global church, there's the universal church, the eternal church, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about the men, women, and children in this room. If you're asking that question, Lord, where are you at work in the lives of your people, then look in the eyes of the men, women, and children to your left and right. And that's what we're doing right now as a church family, build and belong. If you want your heart stirred for where the Lord is at work in the lives of his people, then look to your left and your right. 
I, I, don't, I don't mean like right now. I mean like share lives, share meals, learn spiritual gifts, seek peace, break bread. Hear stories. And you're going to hear stories just like we saw in Nehemiah. You're going to hear stories of one step forward and ten steps back. I thought I was growing in the Lord, and then I went to the temple. And yet tears in their eyes as they speak, as we speak of repentance, as we speak of perseverance, as we speak of joy, as we speak of the Lord's faithful hand in our lives, and our hearts are stirred for him. We need to hear that. We need to hear that. We need to hear the stories of the men and women and children that show up here early, that show up here every Sunday, that give time. Not because I'm like on the phone and be like, you better do it. Like, sometimes I don't even know what y'all are doing. And you're doing it, not because of me, not because of North Village Church, because of your love for Jesus, because God's at work in your life. And so we need to hear those stories. Like, I don't mean just on Sunday morning, like, share testimonies. Sure, we'll do that. But I mean, share stories with each other. Look into the eyes of the people. There's people in our church family who give sacrificially, give financially, give large sums of money for our church family to gather as a church family, sacrifice the comforts of this world, sacrifice other cars, bigger houses, other trips, and I'm going to give to the kingdom. Don't you want to know those people? That's not normal. That's not normal. You want to know those people. That's why we want to build and belong. We want to hear, you want to see God's hand at work in the lives of his people? Look to your left and right. If you're faint-hearted, if you're discouraged, stories of repentance, stories of joy, stories of sacrifice, you're not going to find it in a newspaper. That's so why I went and got a newspaper today. I was assuming this was the case, but I was like, I better go get one just to, just to make sure. Like, look, I'm not picking on the Austin Statesman. Great, great paper. But you're not going to see God's hand at work in the lives of his people in the Austin Statesman. Right? You know this. A bit mysterious and a bit obvious. You know this, right? You're going to see stories. What we got here? We got, oh, what? People are killing each other. Yeah, yeah. Gun violence. Yeah. Corrupt political leaders, yeah, yeah. Ads to go buy stuff that you don't need. It's going to sit in your closet, yeah, yeah. Homicides, that's exciting. Let's read about the increase in homicides in our, in our city. More homicides, more stuff that I don't need, yeah, yeah. More stuff I don't need, yeah. Alcohol, corruption in our courts, yeah. Oh, I'm just so encouraged. Well, no wonder we're faint-hearted. Come on. And I'm not even picking. I'm not picking on, on the Austin Statesman. Go to your Instagram. Go to your social media. Go, go to your favorite, you know, website that you follow. And it's, just, it's this over and over. And then we wonder. I don't feel like the Lord's working. Oh, look at his life. Look at, look at the life of Jesus. Look, look at God's word. Look at his people. Look at his people. Let's end with. Verses 11 to 14. I just want to, want to read and kind of just sit in that. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men, that's humanity, with whom he is pleased. Will you just sit in that for a little bit? It's not it's not meditated peace. It's not absence of war peace. It's not like kind of cool, like throw up the deuce peace. It's talking about peace and humanity. That in our sin that we have gone astray, each to our own way. And Jesus has come to take our sin upon himself and conquer it in the resurrection so that all who believe 
All who believe in him are reconciled. All who believe in him are forgiven. All, all who believe in him are that he is pleased with. That's why there's peace. That the God of creation is not pleased with you because you performed in your job or your academics. He's not pleased with you for your family and your accomplishments. He's not pleased with you for your intellect or your athletic skill. He's pleased with you. The, the shed blood of Jesus at the cross. The perfect life of Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. That's why he's pleased. There's peace. So this morning... Well, I invite you to receive that. If you've never believed in Jesus, you need to do that right now. You should receive it or you should reject it. Like, don't play Christmas. I don't even, like, dabble in the lights and the gifts because it, otherwise Jesus is bonkers. Like, completely reject it or follow him with all your life. Let's not be casual about it. All right, let's give everything, let's cry out to him to ask his help to give him everything. Let's surround the body of Christ around us to help us give everything to him because he's, he's worth it. So we're going to celebrate communion. Our elders are going to come forward. Right, the juice is a symbol of Jesus' body. The bread is a symbol, the juice is a symbol of his blood. The, the cracker is a symbol of his body. It's been broken and poured out for us. So as you walk forward, you're not walking forward as somebody who's accomplished something, who's jumped through the hoops. You're walking forward as somebody who's been made at peace with God through faith in Jesus. So our elders, you come forward, you dip that cracker in that juice, and you celebrate, and I'll pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much. God, I, I confess, I, I, I am quick to give my time, my heart, my thoughts to they're just different things. And then, and then, and then I, I am disheartened because I wonder, where are you?